No, there is the date of filing and the date of receipt by the IRS are completely irrelevant. If you don't get your determination letter, you were not tax exempt and no contributions were deductible. Now, again, that's usually not a problem other than disclosure. You need to be very, very careful what you tell your donor. In every state, there is some degree of charitable supervision, usually through the Attorney General's office. In Oregon, it's called the Charitable Activities Section, and they are very good at what they do. Probably the highest level of charitable supervision of any state except maybe New York. And if the AG's office got wind that a not yet recognized organization was soliciting ostensibly charitable, the tax deductible charitable gifts before it got its letter, bad things would happen. So the normal rule is you file within 15 months, but people screw it up all the time. So there is an automatic 12 month extension. So if you cut through all the rules, the real rule is you need to file within 27 months of your organization. And there's a new rule that says if you missed that, did you really intend to have filed on time if you'd had your act together? And if so, the service will grant you another extension. If you go way out, the problem is if you don't file within this period of time, you can still file, but you lose your retroactivity. So if you go out five years and you file and it's approved, uh, your um, tax exempt status is prospective as of the date of filing, which means you've had a gap. And during that gap, bad things can happen not only to your donors, but to the organization. Why do you care about being um, tax exempt? So you're not taxed on your income. What is your income? Your income can consist of a lot more than interest and dividends. So, you know, it's really, really important to, to follow these rules. Now, the issue that you alluded to, um, if an organization loses its 501c3, then there are rules to protect the innocent donor. And so the, it, it's actually pretty cool. For years and years and years, for us older fellows, if you wanted to look at the list of charitable organizations, it was IRS Publication 78. And it was about like this. And it would list all the organizations. And then the service every month issues notices of revocation, which, you can, which then were distributed in hard copies. The rule was, until the IRS publishes notice that the organization's 501c3 has been yanked, innocent donors can rely. Insiders can't rely. And if a, you have a giant donor that makes a large enough gift to mess up your public charity, that person can't. But innocent donors can rely until the IRS publishes. Fast forward to the internet. There's a very cool, surprisingly, given that it's the IRS, a very cool website where you can uh, actually search for tax-exempt organizations on the IRS website. Its database includes every charitable organization, including not only <coughs> organizations like yours, but also private foundations. And so I'm being careful not to turn this machine off as I reach in for a <laughs> stop. Um, including uh, group exemptions, private foundations, new organizations. Sorry. I have two mics up here for some reason. Yeah, sorry, but that's tax exempt for some reason. <laughs> Should I speak louder? I'll just go with the flow. Nothing if not pliable. Okay, I'll be very careful now. So I'm glossing over a lot of really, really complicated stuff, but my point is, despite your best intentions, there are very complicated and very strict tax rules, including what you need to do to qualify, what you need to do to apply, and what you need to do to keep your exemption. Um, I'll be very, very brief on this. I just mentioned that all 501c3s are presumed to be what's called a private foundation unless you qualify also as a public charity, usually for broad-based public support. Why do you care? You care a lot for two big reasons. Number one, if you don't qualify as a public charity, the tax benefits to your donors, and I would guess 
even in the case of um, bulk food donors, supermarkets, even to those, it would, that would be relevant. Um, the other is private foundations are subject to an excise tax. Probably the biggest in your case, I don't know if organizations like yours are able to get funding from private foundations like the Meyer Memorial Trust and the like. A lot of large funders will not make a grant to an organization unless it is not only a recognized 501c3 charity, but also a public charity and not a private foundation. It's possible for these other big foundations to make grants to other private foundations, but it's a little complicated, and to my surprise, many of them, including sophisticated organizations like the Gates Foundation, generally just refuse to consider it. So it's a very, very important issue. Do you, do you get much foundation funding? <coughs> Murdoch and Meyer, sort of a sidebar, Murdoch and Meyer are private foundations. And if your organization were a private foundation, they probably wouldn't make a grant. And if they did, there's a lot of hoop jumping that, that is required. Pre-grant inquiry, expenditure responsibility agreement, follow-up reporting, on and on and on. With OCF, OCF is a public charity. It's not subject to these rules. It will on occasion make a grant to a private foundation but very rarely, and that's in part because it, 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 those grants give its lawyer fits, and that's me, so that's why. Uh, let's see. Gleaning, and, and I will admit, until a few weeks ago, I didn't realize the newest construction of the term gleaning. I know what gleaning means, but I, I didn't know about this. Until I started doing some internet research, I, I didn't really know about this. It raises some interesting tax issues. Um, mainly the tax consequences of donations from Safeway. Do you get donations from Safeway? So if a large supermarket chain makes a donation of soon-to-be-expired food, for example, it's not your problem, but it's interesting from my standpoint to try to figure out what Safeway, how Safeway treats that from a tax standpoint. Do they treat it as a charitable contribution? If so, how much of it is deductible? And there are very specific rules that apply to contributions of inventory to organizations that help the needy. Uh, are there accountants going to still write the cost off as cost of goods sold? The IRS says, uh-uh, you can't have a double dip, so you can't, they can't write off as cost of goods sold and say it's a charitable contribution. Do they take it as a business expense, similar to advertising or public relations? I don't know. Why do we care? I'll tell you why we care. In just a minute. One of the documents that you have is a form of donor acknowledgement letter, a little one pager. Um, one of my mantras in this world is that sooner or later a donor problem becomes a donee problem. So organizations that raise funds and other gifts don't have an obligation to make sure that your donor doesn't get in trouble, that, that your donor doesn't get the full benefit of his or her deduction. But if your donor has a problem, it's going to affect you at some point. So my theory has been you want to help your donor along the way. Um, and in that regard, there's some rules called substantiation. Let me make sure I know where I am. Uh, charitable substantiation rules that I find fascinating, fascinating because they're incredibly draconian. But the basic rule, and I'm trying very hard not to make paper noise here, um, the basic rule in five minutes, um, over the years the IRS has changed the rules on verifying charitable contributions. In other words, on what donors and donees need to do to make sure that your donor's contribution is tax deductible to the fullest extent of the law. In most cases, the penalty for noncompliance is no deduction at all. Some of these rules dramatically affect your organization. Some of the rules are more of a problem for your donor. Different rules exist in the case of contributions of more than 250, more than 500, more than 5,000, more than 20,000. Different rules in terms of what your donor has to do. Since 1993, and this was not uh, originally a law, it was a regulation, but since 1993, the rule has been that no 
charitable contribution deduction will be allowable for a gift of more than $250 unless the donor receives from the charity what's called a contemporaneous written acknowledgement, which is basically to say a receipt. All right, back to the boring contemporaneous written acknowledgement. Um, regardless of how reliable your donor's records are, your donor has to have this receipt. It has to include a variety of information, it, and it has to be in hand received by your donor on or before the due date for filing your donor's income tax return with extensions. Must be received. Penalty for noncompliance is zero. There's a lot of confusion about what the donor acknowledgement must say. It needs to acknowledge the gift, the date of the gift, a description of the gift. The value of the gift is not your problem and is not your business, even though a lot of organizations think it is. There's also a rule that says the, the charity, and this is the charity's obligation, must notify the donor of the fair value of any goods or services provided to the donor in consideration for the gift. Or what's really wacky, if there were no goods or services, the statement must say so. So, and there are, the, Penalties for non-compliance are not only severe monetary fines on the organization, but your donor loses the deduction. So this silly little form that I gave you merely acknowledges a contribution on a date of property described, and then it says this will also confirm as required by applicable tax regulations that you receive no goods or services in consideration of your gift. Those of us in this community have kind of laughed at this rule because it's, it's just kind of, kind of stupid. Well. The month before last, there was a case, a tax court case. And in this tax court case, a couple gave a $25,000 gift to their church. And this wasn't the, you know, the church of the Holy Drive-By. I mean, this was a real mainstream church, $25,000 canceled check. They got a receipt. Thank you for your gift. The receipt didn't say they didn't get any goods or services. The tax court held the deduction was zero. So it's now been confirmed that a penalty for noncompliance is, in fact, no deduction. So these are really, really critical rules. This gets a little bit, a little bit beyond what would you need to worry about. But just, yes, ma'am. Does that include, let's say it's around the holidays and you bring cookies to your donors or something like that? Well, that's a very good question. I, I don't go into that much because I like to scare people, but there are some exceptions, one of which is for token benefits. So if, for example, you make a gift to OPB and you get a mug that says OPB, you're okay, or cookies. There's also different rules for services and food and events that you put on for donors as a whole. Okay. Um, the token benefits rule is the important one because that means you can give minor stuff. It's complicated because the, um, the amount involved to be a token benefit, I can't remember what it was, it was fixed and it's adjusted for inflation, which means every year it changes. Like this year, it might be $14.69. I mean, who knows what it is. But it's designed specifically so you don't have to worry about those pesky things. Picture how these rules work in a charitable auction. I mean, one of my favorite stories ever was a, a good, good, good friend of mine who's a lawyer who I shall not name, but he said, God, wife and I went to an auction, and she's always wanted a white baby grand piano and they had one and I got it for $20,000. And so now the rule is I can take my old piano back and go buy it back. So they bought it back for $10,000 and after I read off the $20,000, it didn't cost me anything. What's wrong with that? The person didn't make a charitable gift. The person bought a piano. So if you're ever involved in a charitable auction, it's very hard to do anything other than acknowledge a gift from somebody for the auction. My counsel to charities is don't give anybody who buys at the auction any information about anything. The other rule I'll mention briefly, and then I'll move on, is among these charitable substantiation and disclosure rules is a rule that says in the case of a gift of non-cash, non-publicly traded securities with a value of over $5,000, in order to get a deduction, your donor needs to get a qualified appraisal from a qualified appraiser, and the donor, the donee, and the appraiser need to sign, and the donor has to file an IRS form 8283. One of the other new cases in the last two months is one where a guy made, I'm guessing it was like $19 million of gifts. He was an appraiser. He did his own appraisal. He undervalued everything. 
But he got to the forum, and where the appraiser says, it says, don't eat, or don't or can't sign. He said, well, I'm the don't or, so I'm the appraiser, so I can't sign. So he didn't sign that line. Zero deduction. <coughs> Zero. Yes? Was the donor of the form of acknowledgement be online, or does it need to be hard copy? That's a good question. It can be online. There are a variety of very practical rules to, to take into account things like um, gifts at an un unmanned drop box, um, volunteer services, mileage, um, although there is a new, new rule that says you still need, for unreimbursed donor expenses, you still need a receipt. So you can't just incur expenses on behalf of an organization at which, for example, you're a board member and just write them off. Like, you know, I went to Medford for this um, charity business, spent three days, drove down. You, you, regardless of how good your records are, you, you, need, you need either a canceled check or a receipt in that example. Um, the IRS, on the IRS website, there are some really, really good IRS publications on things like this, and they're all downloadable. Um, so there's, for example, there are some really good practical uh, brochures on helping a charity follow these rules. A little bit about serving on a board. Uh, <clears throat> this, this is an important issue. The key, as you know probably better than I, to a successful organization is the ability to recruit and retain and engage board members. The, the, the board is what drives your organization forward. And frequently, the people that you're trying to recruit are very busy, usually pretty successful local business people. And you're asking them not only to donate large amounts of their time and perhaps money, but also to you know, step into this hornet's nest uh, with some potential liabilities. And so it's, it's going to be really important to your board members for them to be assured that they're not in going to incur liability just for serving on your board. Um, <clears throat> So because of that, the Oregon Nonprofit Corporation statutes have some very important provisions. Um, all board members are subject to very, very strict fiduciary duties, including the duty of loyalty and the duty of care. Your board member's duty of care is the same duty of care that applies to a director of I IBM, which is the business judgment rule, which is to say decisions made in good faith generally will be presumed by the court to be prudent. The court does not want to second guess your board members. Um, there are also some protections from liability. I alluded earlier to some provisions in the articles and bylaws. And a matter of fact, I'll even show you what they are. Go back to the articles, if you will. The rule in Oregon is that generally the civil liability of an uncompensated board member is limited to gross negligence or intentional misconduct, which is a big limitation. If you look on the sample articles at Article 11, this just basically confirms what the law says. So why do I include it? Well, it's because your board members are going to want to see it. The other important issue is in Oregon, like in most states, there are some mandatory indemnities. So your nonprofit corporation must indemnify officers and directors against certain liabilities, and may go beyond those liabilities. So at the bottom of page three in my articles, you'll see I have a, an indemnification that basically says, to the fullest extent permitted by law, the corporation shall indemnify those people. If you turn to the bylaws and go all the way back to section six, and I'd give you the page number, but you can tell I revised these yesterday because my secretary was out, and apparently I made the page number go away. I have got one and a half pages of the complicated provisions on the nature of the indemnity of officers and directors. This is the law. This doesn't have to be in the bylaws. Why do I put it in the bylaws? Because your directors want to see it. When you ask somebody to join your board, hopefully a director is going to want to look at your bylaws and we'll want to see this. The other question that your prospective board member needs to ask is directors and officers liability insurance. In my view, every operating charitable organization, which is to say anything beyond a passive 
grant-making organization really needs to get a director's and officer's liability policy for the benefit of the organization and for the benefit of the director. I just mentioned earlier there are some mandatory indemnities. So you can tell your director, ah, don't worry, we'll indemnify you. Well, an indemnity is only as good as the money backing it. So again, I think it's critical to the organization and to the board and to the officers to get D&O insurance. It is always a good idea. The corporation may buy it. <coughs> so the corporation may buy D&O insurance for the benefit of board members without regard to any restrictions on private benefit, inurement, excess benefit. You can do it, you should do it. It is not general liability insurance. Now I have, uh, on my homeowner's policy, I have an umbrella through Safeco. And it includes, automatically includes coverage of me serving as a volunteer member of a nonprofit board of directors. The exceptions from coverage are way broader than those included though. So it's, I like having that umbrella, but it is unlikely that if I ever were to incur liability as a member of a board that I would be covered. For example, um, I am currently the president of the board of Portland Opera and the Broadway series here, which is, causes my friends no end of amusement because my reputation is more playing golf and playing cards, but I'm president of Portland Opera. And unlike other organizations where I've served on the board, they actually want me to make decisions. And some of those decisions relate to employment matters. So I'm making decisions relating to the employment or termination of employment of somebody. That's far and away the number one kind of lawsuit in the nonprofit world. My nonprofit umbrella gives me zero coverage for that. But I am covered under Portland Opera's DNO policy. So that's pretty important. Um, what are some other restrictions? And I'm, I'm, it's 10 till, so I'm still okay. Um, what are some other important issues if you're on the board? Your board of directors are all fiduciaries and they're prohibited from violating their duty of good care, due care, their duty of loyalty, and they're prohibited from engaging in, in conflicts of interest. Um, it, is, it is important and becoming increasingly important for your board members to be mindful of this. In the IRS Form 1023, and I'm not sure where it is, but there's a question that basically says, has your organization adopted a conflict of interest policy following the form in the instructions? Now, there is no federal law that has anything to do with state law conflicts of interest. It's none of the IRS's business. It's a result of Senator Grassley and the House Ways and Means Committee believing that they should try to legislate best practices through the tax code. It's really goofy. So if I'm filing a 1023 for a mom and apple pie charity, my answer to that is no. Our board understands Oregon law on conflicts of interest and they will follow the law. I won't do it. If I'm at all worried about going to war with the IRS in a new organization, my answer is yes ma'am. Um, so sometimes it's important. It is, in all fairness, very important for an organization's board to adopt a conflict policy and to periodically affirm it. So what I did, and the handout that went out to you today is my newest form of conflict of interest policy. What I did with this policy is I took the terribly drafted IRS form, which included sentences without verbs, and I, 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 try, I turned it into something that I thought was a little tighter and something that actually relates to Oregon law. So this document includes all the elements suggested by the IRS and it refers properly to, to Oregon law. It is important for your organization to adopt a conflict of interest policy. And I think, my own personal view, it's important for, the, for your board members to reaffirm it. The last page of the policy is a sample affirmation where you ask your board every year to list conflicts and then they confirm that, that they've read the conflict policy, that they understand it, that they will, they will comply with it. If you are ever audited by the IRS on some of these best practices, it's nice to be able to show the IRS that your board members do this. It really is. So in terms of actual conflicts of interest, 
Um, the Oregon statutes are pretty clear on, what's, on what a conflict of interest is. It needs to be an economic interest held by your board member. It re re requires that the board member declare the conflict uh, with respect to the transaction and that the transaction be approved by a disinterested board or committee of the board. So you declare it, the board has to approve it. It needs to be fair. You don't have, this board member does not have to recuse him or herself, doesn't have to leave the room. I mean, how you want to run your board is how you want to run the board. The important thing is to be able to recognize the conflict. Why? Several reasons. Number one, all or all nonprofit corporation statutes prohibit the board and the director from engaging in conflict of interest economic transactions unless you jump through these hoops. What else? Tax problems. If you're a private foundation, there is an absolute prohibition against what's called self-dealing, which is basically almost any transaction between an insider like a board member and the organization. Until several years ago, and that rule applies to private foundations, not public charities, and you're all going to be public charities. Until several years ago, if a public charity engaged in an excess benefit transaction, be it an excess benefit to a board member, excessive compensation to your executive director, excessive expense reimbursements, and the only hammer the IRS had was the death penalty, which was to revoke your 501c3 entirely. That's the only ammo they had. And so Congress passed some rules called the Intermediate Sanction Rules, which apply to any excess benefit transaction between your charity and an insider, and it imposes on the insider a ta penalty tax equal to 200% of the amount involved. So, it, so it's a real, real hammer. You need to be mindful of these things. Uh, years ago, a lawyer at the National Council on Foundations came up with kind of a, a spectrum. On one side of the spectrum are conflict of interest transactions that are also prohibited by the tax code, and as you morph to the other side of the spectrum, you have transactions that are not prohibited, but ones that might be a matter of best practices. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Can an organization hire a board member's construction company to do an improvement? Well, the answer is it is a conflict of interest. It can be approved by the board if it's fair. Um, and it can happen. And it's not a tax problem unless you're a private foundation. Your private foundation is prohibited. Um, how about hiring a director's law firm to perform reasonable legal services? Well, once again, there are no tax problems. Conflict of interest needs to be approved. Here's where they get interesting. How about approving a grant to a charity where a member of your board is the paid president? How about approving a grant to a charity when one of the board members is on the board of the grantee? How about Birch requesting a grant from a foundation where one of your board members is on the grant-making board. So these are, and that's not a conflict of interest. My best practices, my view has been, you declare your interest, and then you, you declare it on the record, you keep good minutes, and you move forward. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? I'm sort of getting at the end of my canned stuff. But I can talk forever about anything if you want me to. Um, that's probably all I have in my can talk. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really familiar with Birch other than what I, I've heard and what I saw on the internet. Uh, more and more organizations, and not really gleaning organizations unless you become very successful, but more and more organizations as they try to grow will start doing things like capital campaigns. Sometimes you'll, if you're really lucky, uh, you'll start thinking about whether you can actually begin an endowment to tide you over in difficult times. Um, I, I don't know. Generally, your, your in-kind donations versus cash donations, what magnitude of comparison is there? Nevertheless, um, especially in these dicey economic times, more and more organizations are trying to develop endowment programs, which brings a whole new set of issues. So I would love comments, questions, disagreements. Start in the back. 
required. Uh, these are completely unreimbursed volunteer hours. I'm not aware of any requirement, but it's, I think it's a good practice to do that for several reasons. Um, one of which is that when you recruit board members and volunteers later, that's going to be uh, something. Um, there are some different issues for especially expenses of uh, overseas volunteers where it, can, where it can get much more complicated, especially from an auditing standpoint, but I'm not aware of any IRS requirement. Anybody else aware of one? You know, I, I was asked specifically whether I would talk about the 990, and my answer was very simple. I said, no. Um, we do very little compliance. I think my firm last year did one 990. I review 990s, but we don't prepare them. And part of the reason for that is, you know, this is my political bias here, is that the IRS is going well beyond the Internal Revenue Code in trying to impose best practices through the 1023 and the 990. That's an example. One could say that's none of the business of the IRS. So, yeah. I just wanted a little bit more clarification on, you were talking, it sounded like earlier, you were saying there's some challenges if you refer to your client base you're serving as members, and the organization we're with, Skagit Gleaners, we have a membership base, so similar to Birch Community Services, mm -hmm. there's a membership fee to be a part of it, and are there other words you would suggest, or is that, is that what you were, Right. Your clients as members. Um, it's, it's partly my personal bias and partly some bad experiences. So you have two kinds of nonprofit corporations, member and non-member. Okay. If it's a non-member organization, the board of directors is generally <coughs> self-perpetuating, which is to say the board runs the organization, the board elects its own successor. Okay. A member organization, uh, in a member organization, members are like shareholders. So you have an annual meeting of members in addition to your board and the members have certain rights, not only under the articles, but under the statute, and those rights include the power to throw out the board. So a true member can do that. Um, there are lots of high-profile Oregon organizations that used to be member organizations, including Portland Opera, including the High Desert Music.